Hello, everybody. And thanks for coming uh, here so early after this uh, amazing uh, evening we had yesterday at L'Alle de Lyon. I'm Lionel Medini. I'm the third uh, general co-chair of the conference. And uh, I hope you are all awake and listening uh, since we have a great program today. First, we will have a keynote on web privacy and security from the user's perspective. Uh, immediately followed by a panel where, we, we, where you will be able to uh, ask questions and to participate. Then you will uh, discover the presentation of the 2019 edition of the conference. And then we will have the break, which will be your last chance to uh, discover and to vote for posters and to de and demos. So don't miss it. After this, uh, we will have, uh, as usual, two sessions uh, before and after lunch. And then the closing session, during which we will be, we'll, we'll have uh, a take-home message from uh, Robert Calio, who is the founder of, of IWTC2 and the web conference series, uh, as well as the award ceremony, where we'll, we, we will uh, award the best uh, research paper best poster, best demo, uh, as well as the best reviewers for the uh, research track. Just one point about the um, uh, best poster and best demo. Uh, as I told you, you can vote for them. So please do uh, go to the uh, exhibition hall, find the best poster or the best demo you want to vote for. And uh, after this, you will have on the uh, poster board uh, a number that you uh, will have to write on a paper and put in the uh, ballot boxes that are on the registration desk. So now it is my honor to uh, introduce our third keynote speaker who will talk about web privacy and security, the user experience. She is the four systems professor of computer science and of engineering and public policy at Carnegie Mellon University, where she is the director of the SILAB Usable Privacy and Security Laboratory. She is associate department head uh, of the engineering and public policy department and co-director of the MSIT Privacy Engineering Master's Program. She is a leading researcher in both online privacy and usable privacy and security she has played a key role in building the usable privacy and security research community and founded the symposium on usable privacy and security. She chaired the platform for privacy prefer preferences project, also known as uh, P3P uh, W3C working group. She served as chief technologist at the US Federal Trade Commission uh, and was appointed as a Privacy by Design Ambassador for the Privacy Commissioner of Ontario in Canada. She is also a co-founder of Wombat Security Technologies Incorporated. She, she has co-authored over 150 research papers in these areas, authored one book and co-edited a second. She was named uh, an SAM Fellow in 2014 and an IEEE Fellow in 2016, and she was elected uh, to the ACM Chi Academy in 2017. So I must confess that I had a bit of an issue uh, about the introduction of this uh, speaker, given the topic of the talk, because uh, talking about privacy, I didn't know if I could disclose her name. Of course, Fabien, who took care of those slides of all the plenary sessions, didn't have my scruples, so thanks to him, I can very warmly welcome, and I hope you will very warm, warmly welcome, Lori Faith Craner. Good morning, everyone, and uh, thanks for waking up early and coming to hear this talk. We're going to talk about privacy and security from the user perspective. So security and privacy are what is known as secondary tasks. 
So unless you are a security professional, you probably don't sit down in front of your computer on a regular basis to do security and privacy. We sit down in front of our computer to send emails and to watch videos and play games and do our homework, but we generally don't want to spend a lot of time doing security and privacy. But on the other hand, if we want to actually protect our security and privacy, there are a lot of things that we are still expected to do. And I'm going to talk about a number of these things today. So we'll talk about privacy policies. They're on websites. We're supposed to read them. Of course, most people don't. And then there are these little symbols and icons that are supposed to tell us something about privacy and uh, help us do something to protect it. And then we have private browsing modes and various privacy features in our web browsers that we may or may not really understand what to do with. And then, of course, there are passwords. Seems like we have more and more of them all the time, except that they're supposed to be long and uh, unique and hard for other people to figure out, and oh, we're supposed to remember them and not use the same ones over and over again. And then every now and then, something pops up with some sort of a problem. Oh my gosh, my connection is not private. What do I do now? So I'm going to talk about all of these things. So we'll get started with privacy policies. So about 10 years ago, my student at the time, Alicia McDonald, came into my office. And some of you may know Alicia because she's been involved in Do Not Track. Uh, so Alicia said, I have an idea for a research project. Let's figure out what would happen if everybody read all the privacy policies at all of the websites that they visit. And I said, well, Alicia, don't be ridiculous. <laughs> like, that will never happen. And, and she said, yeah, I know it will never happen, but let, let, let's figure it out anyway. And so she uh, went and got some data. She got data about how many different websites most people visit in a typical month. Uh, she got data about how many words are in a website privacy policy. Uh, she got data about how fast people read. She crunched all the numbers, and she came back and she said, well, if everybody read all of the privacy policies at all of the websites they visit, ev even just once a year, they would spend 244 hours per year reading privacy policies. Okay, that is clearly ridiculous. Like, I actually spend more time than I'd like to reading privacy policies, and I do not spend 244 hours per year reading privacy policies. Uh, so this suggests that the notion that we have these policies that are only useful if people read them uh, you know, is a good idea for privacy. This suggests that this, maybe there's a problem there. Now, of course, this was 10 years ago, so maybe things have changed. And fortunately, here at this conference this week, we actually had an update. Um, so there was a paper presented that, that uh, evaluated this again, and they said, well, maybe this is an overestimate. It could be that since the length of the privacy policies we calculated was only for the most popular websites, it turns out that if you look at the less popular websites, their privacy policies tend to be shorter. So maybe this is an overestimate. On the other hand, this paper also pointed out that most websites have third parties that are embedded in them and are also collecting data. So really, it's not enough to read the privacy policy of the first party website. You also have to read the privacy policies of the third party websites. And if you add that in, then this is probably an underestimate. And it might take actually even longer to read all the privacy policies. And this is what a typical privacy policy looks like. Uh, this is one for an American website, and it's 30 pages long. Um, so no wonder that people don't really want to read these things. And in fact, this is not uh, a surprise. Uh, this is a quote from a report that came, um, came out from the US White House about four years ago. Only in some fantasy world do users actually read these notices and understand their implications before clicking to indicate their consent. So we all know that it's actually a fantasy that people will read privacy policies. 
So if we know that nobody's reading them, why is it important to have them? Well, there are many reasons. So first of all, there are laws that require them. And with the new European GDPR regulations, uh, there are going to be more and more companies, even outside of Europe, that are going to need to have privacy policies. In the US, where we don't have so many privacy laws, um, we also have some uh, companies in, so in some uh, industries that have to have privacy policies. But even if they're not required by law to have privacy policies, uh, most companies have them. And this allows um, regulators in the United States to actually enforce privacy on these companies, even if there isn't a privacy law. So we have laws for um, uh, laws against fraudulent and deceptive practices. And so if a company has a privacy policy and they make a certain commitment to privacy, and then they don't follow that commitment, then they have violated a law, even if it's not a privacy law. Privacy policies also provide people with information about the choices they have about privacy and how they can opt out of certain types of data collection practices. Um, and so you need to actually read the privacy policy to find out what your choices are and how you can opt out. And even if not everybody reads privacy policies, there are some people who do routinely read privacy policies. These people tend to be privacy advocates, journalists, and regulators. And if they read privacy policies and find something surprising and something that we should... Uh, is that better? Okay. <laughs> That's so surprising. It's something that we should know about. It often makes the front page news. And so we all find out about the companies that may be violating our privacy. There are also automated tools that can give us information about privacy policies. And while they generally don't um, read the whole privacy policy, they do extract certain key pieces of information. So this is an example of a tool called Ghostery, which keeps track of the third-party um, trackers that are on websites, and it can give you a summary of them. All right, so the problem with privacy policies on websites is bad enough, but now our data is being collected by IoT devices in our environment. And this poses an even bigger problem. Are you going to stop every drone flying by and see if it has a privacy policy? What about those smart light bulbs and smart thermostats? What data are they collecting about you? So this, this, this is also um, quite a problem. But it's a problem that we need to solve. So I spent 2016 working at the US Federal Trade Commission for Commissioner Edith Ramirez, and uh, she said in a speech about IoT privacy, the question is not whether consumers should be given a say over unexpected uses of their data. Rather, the question is how to provide simplified notice and choice. And in Europe, we have the same demand. The EU uh, General Data Protection Regulation says that we need to have information about privacy that is tra transparent and easily accessible. It has to be in an intelligible form, using clear and plain language. But how do we do this? One idea that people have been talking about for a while is to use food nutrition labels as a model. They're pretty clear, and uh, most people seem to understand them. And we've had them in the US for a while, but now we even have them internationally. So this is the uh, bag of pretzels I got on the airplane with a, um, a, a nutrition label in both English and French. And this is becoming increasingly common in countries around the world. So there are a number of things that are useful about nutrition labels. Um, one is that they're standardized. That means that once you learn how to use them, once you learn about the different components of a nutrition label, you can pick up any food product that has this nutrition label and you'll be able to understand it. You can also put two products side by side and compare them. Because the language is standardized, if there are new terms that you learn, you, you find out what does it mean, cholesterol, sodium. Once you learn it, you can then apply that term to every food product that you look at. They're brief. You can find information quickly. 
and they're generally linked to an extended view. Um, in the case of food, that is the full list of ingredients. But on privacy policies, especially online privacy policies, you can have your short version linked to a more complete version, uh, the, the version that only the lawyers will love. Um, and this is what's known as a layered privacy notice. So here's an example of a privacy nutrition label that my students at Carnegie Mellon came up with. Um, they worked on this about 10 years ago. Um, and you can see in this particular version, you have different types of information down the left column. And these are fairly coarse groupings of information. And across the top, we have different uses of information that a company might engage in. Um, and we can see from the colored cells at a glance how much uh, the, uh, how much information this company collects and whether it's required or if it's opt-out or opt-in and whatnot. Now, even better than a nutrition label format, perhaps we could have our computers read privacy policies for you. And that was the idea behind the Platform for Privacy Preferences, or P3P. And so this is a W3C standard that came out in 2002, and I chaired that working group um, for almost uh, six or seven years uh, as part of that project. Now, as we were working on P3P, which was an XML language for privacy policies, I realized that in order for P3P to be useful, we needed good user agents that would allow people to actually uh, have P3P do something useful for them, because nobody wants to actually read that XML. Um, so I worked on a project at AT&T, which is where I was working at the time, uh, to develop a user agent called Privacy Bird. And the way Privacy Bird worked is that at every website you visited, Privacy Bird would go and fetch the P3P policy and analyze it for you. And you could set up your personal privacy preferences, and you'd set it up once at the beginning, and at every website it would check to see if there was a match. So if you were at a website that matched your privacy preferences, you get a green chirping bird, and chirp is missing. Nope, no chirp. Back and forth. Back and forth. All right, <laughs> we have a chirp. Um, so we have a green uh, happy chirp here at this, uh, at this website because its privacy policy matches my preferences. And I can click on the bird, and I can bring up a more detailed view of the privacy policy. This is basically translated from the XML into a human-readable language automatically. Um, on the other hand, if I visit a website that doesn't match my privacy preferences, Just again. Apparently, you're not going to hear the red angry bird. No, no, I can't try again. <laughs> yeah. All right, it worked before. Anyway, trust me, you, you get a, it sounded like a crow. <laughs> it was a red angry bird. Um, and, and that indicates bad privacy. Um, you can also find out in some cases that maybe there's something you can opt out of so that the privacy policy would be acceptable to you. And so uh, Privacy Bird provided a link to the page where you could go and opt out. So um, we, we used Privacy Bird and we tested it and it, it seemed to work pretty well. But one problem that people complained about is if I go to a website and I get that red angry bird and I realize that they don't have a good privacy policy, perhaps I'm, I'm uh, in the process of trying to buy something online and I need to find a different website that would respect my privacy. And it was really difficult with Privacy Bird because I had to go trial and error to different websites until I found one where the bird would turn green. And so we developed a search engine that had Privacy Bird built in. And this was called Privacy Finder. So here, you run a search, and then you see along the left column those green boxes. And those are privacy meters uh, indicating which websites have privacy policies that match my preferences. And we did a study here to find out whether anybody cared. Would this actually change the purchasing habits of people online? 
Uh, so we, in this study, we actually uh, assigned people to go shopping online. Um, and, uh, and, we, and we set up the system so that we had uh, different websites they could purchase from and that the products were more expensive at the websites with better privacy policies. And what we found is that with this salient privacy information, many people would actually pay a little bit more to shop at the websites with better privacy policies. So this was one of the first demonstrations that uh, when privacy information is salient, people will actually pay for privacy. Now Microsoft built P3P into their Internet Explorer web browser in version 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. And it was on by default. So the 99.9% you know, .9 of people who never changed their IE privacy settings had this P3P default privacy setting. And what the setting was, was that first of all, um, a website that did not have what's known as a P3P compact privacy policy had their third party cookies rejected. Um, a, a compact privacy policy in this case was a, a, um, an extra HTTP header so that the web browser could quickly make a cookie blocking decision without having to parse the full XML policy. So by default, you don't have the compact policy. Third party cookies get blocked. Now, if you have a, a compact policy, then Internet Explorer would evaluate it and decide whether it was satisfactory according to Microsoft. And if it was not satisfactory, then again, the, the third party cookie would be rejected. Now the problem was that this implementation did no syntax checking. And we did a study. Um, we scraped all of the P3P compact policies that we could find, about 33,000 of them. And we found that about a third of them had syntax errors in them. Um, they had bogus po um, uh, compact policies, or they had compact policies that were missing required tokens. And we found some evidence that a lot of these were not just casual errors, but in fact, errors that had been committed on purpose. Um, so this is an example of a valid compact policy. So you can see it's all three and four letter tokens, and there's a certain set of them that re are required. You have to have you know, one from each category at least. And here are some examples of invalid compact policies. Facebook does not have a P3P policy. Learn why here. Right? None of these are valid P3P compact policy tokens. Um, and then Amazon just had AMZN, which looks like it might, you know, it, it's four characters, but that's a completely made up and meaningless compact policy token. So these compact policies mean nothing. They're completely um, uh, useless for Internet Explorer, except that it, it ensures that Internet Explorer will not block your third party cookies. Um, so I saw this and I wrote a paper about it. Um, and the New York Times actually picked up on it, so it got quite a bit of publicity, but nothing happened. And then two years later, Microsoft finally decided to do something about it, and they wrote a blog post accus accusing Google of bypassing their user privacy settings. It was Google and you know, 30,000 other websites. Um, and Google fired back, and they said, well, Microsoft uses a self-declaration protocol known as P3P dating from 2002, and it is well known that it is impractical to comply with Microsoft's request while providing modern web functionality. Well, I think that's debatable, but maybe P3P is obsolete. Um, and uh, so I sat back and wondered, well, is anything gonna happen now? And it continued, nothing happened. Um, and my understanding is that now W3C is actually considering declaring P3P obsolete. And that's too bad because there really is nothing to replace it. And increasingly, people are coming up to me and saying, we should really have a computer readable language for privacy policies. And I kind of laugh and say, yeah, we, we, we should. <laughs> um, now we do have do not track, or at least we're trying to have do not track, and maybe someday soon we will have do not track. Uh, do not track is actually built into the major web browsers, but it doesn't really do anything particularly useful for users as, as, uh, for the time being. And so we have a lot of tracking. 
and companies are using this tracking in order to serve targeted ads to us. And you can see this one has me figure it out pretty well, or at least <laughs> according to my kids. <laughs> yeah, no wonder you got that ad, Mom. <laughs> uh, and this one has me figured out pretty well, too. I, I spend too much time buying uh, camera equipment. Um, and the second one, you may notice something interesting about it. In the top right corner, there's this bl little blue triangle icon. And if I click on this icon, I can actually get information about why this ad was targeted to me. And sometimes when I click on this icon, and I, I do this a lot, the information I get is not very useful. But this one actually made some sense. Uh, this one explained that there were a bunch of products that I viewed on this particular website that it was keeping track of, and that people who viewed those products tended to go on to purchase products which they were now advertising to me. So that makes sense. And it also gives me information about how to temporarily disable this tracking or to permanently disable this tracking. So this is actually fairly useful. But most people don't understand this. So this, this is fake news. It's from The Onion. But this is a story that I hear from people I know all the time. People say, these shoes are following me around the internet. I can't get rid of them. That toaster is following me around the internet. And they don't understand why it happens. And I say, well, don't you click on that little blue triangle thing? And they don't know what I'm talking about. And sometimes when I click on that little blue triangle thing, I don't really get very useful information. So I like to check the weather forecast late at night before I go to bed. And I discovered that I was getting ads routinely about pharmaceutical products. And not even pharmaceutical products for any types of conditions that I have or that I remember doing any web searches related to. Just kind of random pharmaceutical products. Um, and so I clicked on that little icon and I found out the name of the drug company that was advertising to me. And they claim that these were ads likely to be of interest based on your web browsing activity. But it is a complete mystery to me as to what sort of web browsing activity they think I was doing that was relevant to these pharmaceutical products. So we did a study in our lab to see how well other people understand this sort of ad targeting and the tools that you can use in order to opt out and prevent this sort of targeting. So we evaluated tools that were built into web browsers, as well as some online consumer choice tools, which would set opt-out cookies to opt out of tracking, uh, as well as some browser plugins. So when we interviewed 48 people, we found that people understood a little bit about online ad targeting. And they did understand that there was some potential here to help them that they could get ads for products that they might actually be interested in purchasing, and they thought that was a good thing. However, they were very concerned about privacy. They were very concerned about what information these companies were collecting about them and what they were going to do with it. And they did not understand at all how this particular technology worked. They didn't understand what information was being collected or where it was going to go. And they had a lot of misconceptions about it and a lot of fears. They, ha they also had misconceptions about this little blue triangle thingy, this ad choices icon. Some people told us that they thought if you clicked on it, you would express interest in the product. Or it was a way to purchase ads for your, uh, on your own. Or it was a way to go to the product's website. Or a way to see related ads. These things are all completely wrong. We also asked people how they thought they could prevent tracking. A lot of people talked about deleting cookies. Some people said they thought there was something in their antivirus product that maybe could help them. Some people talked about web browser controls, although most of them didn't really know which control they would actually use. And some people said, oh no, you cannot prevent tracking. It's just not possible. We also showed people a number of uh, companies that do online tracking. We showed them the names of the companies. And we asked them 
how familiar they were with those companies, as well as how much they trust them to do tracking for them. Would they want to allow those companies to track them? So on the bottom left, you see companies like 24-7 Real Media, Blue Kai, Casal Media. Those were all companies that people said, hey, we're not familiar with these companies. Why should we trust them? And then on the right, you see something even more interesting. So people said, oh, Google, yeah, I use that search engine all the time. I'm very familiar. Sure, they, they can target me. Microsoft advertising, hey, I'm familiar with them too, but I already have a computer. I don't need to buy another one. Why should I have Microsoft advertise to me? And then AOL advertising, well, I'm familiar with AOL. I used to have their internet service. It never worked very well. Why should I trust them? So you can see that people are making privacy decisions based on information that really has nothing to do with the kinds of, of use of their data. Um, so uh, people were kind of at a loss to figure out how they could use this information about the name of a company to make these sorts of privacy decisions. So then we sent people to use some of these tools. So this is um, the tool from the Digital Advertising Alliance. It's on their website. Um, and we asked them to use the tool to opt out of tracking. And here people went and they clicked on everything on this page that looked like it was clickable and nothing worked. And eventually, if they clicked randomly or if they gave up and asked us, they found out you were supposed to click on that checkbox, which doesn't look like a clickable item. And that's how you actually get to the opt-out page. And by the way, this I view as a, a huge usability problem was in place for like six or seven years before the DAA finally got around to changing it. Um, if you do click on that checkbox, you get to this page here, and the little wheel spins for a while and says it's checking the trackers on your computer. Um, and then eventually you get this long list of hundreds of different companies you've never heard of and ask you which ones you want to opt out of. Now, when people tried Ghostery, and this is a version of Ghostery from, from a long time ago. This is uh, what we tested in, back in uh, 2011. Um, Ghostery also had that long list of websites you've never heard of, which confused people, as well as a lot of jargon, like web bugs and cookie protection, and people didn't quite know what that was. And then the Internet Explorer interface, if you wanted to actually change those default settings, it had a lot of jargon as well, including third-party cookies and compact privacy policy, or first-party cookies. And, th and uh, on this setting, it says that you can, um, uh, uh, you can uh, this adjustment protects you um, and its cookies without your implicit consent. Without my implicit consent, that sounds kind of like a double negative, and I'm not entirely sure what this means. So we found in this study that users really can't use the existing opt-out tools effectively. Um, and we came up with a bunch of recommendations. And um, thankfully, actually, a lot of the tool providers followed a number of our recommendations. And they did actually improve uh, the tools. So Ghostery is, is an example of a tool which has improved quite a bit since this, this paper. Um, so we recommended that they reduce jargon. And they provide feedback to users so they would know what was happening. Um, we also said that you really can't expect users to understand these technologies or distinguish between hundreds of different tracking companies. Uh, we also pointed out that cookies were problematic as a means to opt out because people delete them, and that people don't recognizes, recognize this ad choices icon. So the industry fired back, the ad industry, and they said, oh, what do you mean people don't recognize this ad choices icon? It has revolutionized consumer education. We were a little skeptical, and we said, OK, well, we'll do another study to see if we were right the first time or not. So this time, instead of just 48 participants, we had over 1,500 participants in our study. We did, the, we did this online with Amazon Mechanical Turk. So we showed people a screenshot of the New York Times website, which had a number of ads with the ad choices icon present. And we asked people first whether they saw anything related to privacy on this page. And the vast majority of people said, nope. And then we drew their attention to an ad with 
an icon, and a tagline. And we actually tested both the actual ad choices icon as well as another icon which had been previously considered by the industry. And we tested a bunch of different taglines. So besides ad choices, we tested some other taglines that some websites were using, as well as some taglines that we made up, and the no tagline. So then we asked people some questions, like what would happen if you clicked on the icon? And we gave people a number of choices and asked them which ones they agreed with. And so I'm going to show you some responses. And note, this adds up to more than 100, because some people thought more than one thing would happen. So 56% of people thought more ads will pop up. That's wrong. 45% thought it will take you to a page where you can buy advertisements on websites. This is also wrong. And 27% thought it will take you to a page where you can opt out of tailored ads. Finally, the right answer. But only 27% of people got the right answer. Now, fortunately, we tested other taglines as well. So with the tagline configure ad preferences, people did a lot better. We got up to 50% with the right answer. I mean, that's still a failing grade, but, but still, it's a lot better. <laughs> um, and this suggested to us that if the ad industry actually wanted to communicate better about privacy, they could do some iterative testing and refining of their icon and their taglines, and they could probably improve communication quite a bit. They have chosen not to do that. <laughs> so there have been some uh, recent changes to the opt-out tools. Um, the industry has uh, spiffed up their website a bit. Um, and now when you go there and try to opt out, you get an experience that looks something like this. And I did this on my computer the other day, and this wheel with the percentage turns very, very, very slowly. Um, but eventually got up to 100%. And then I got this long scrolling list of different uh, websites, uh, different trackers I might want to opt out of, and I click the opt out of all button. And then it told me something about, oh, I had third party cookie blocking on my computer, and this was going to be a problem, but if I press the green button, I could begin opt out now. And then I watched the wheel turn again very, very slowly as it was preparing my browser. And then I watched the wheel turn very slowly again. And then I had success Oh, for 10 out of 123 companies. I have no idea what happened to the other 113 companies and why I had no success, but I had no success. And sure enough, when I went back and looked at the list of companies, they all said that the opt-out was temporarily unavailable. And I tried it again later, and they were still temporarily unavailable. Oh, well. Um, <laughs> So Ghostery, as I mentioned, at, has actually improved quite a bit. Instead of that long list of websites, now they are put into categories. And you can configure Ghostery with the different categories of trackers and decide for an entire category whether to allow it or not. Um, and then when you visit a web page, you can see how many trackers that you have sorted by category. And then you can drill down and look at the particular trackers in that category if you want to. Um, and then you can also um, uh, click through and get more information about a particular tracker. Um, and then you can actually get the link to go and read the full privacy policy for that tracker, if you like. And now you're back to reading privacy policies again. So my students are currently working on a project where we are reading privacy policies and looking for opt-out information. Um, because this is what most users do, actually, when they, when they want to read a privacy policy. It's because they're trying to figure out how to opt out. So what should you look for? Can you like, just jump to that part of the policy with the opt-out information? Um, you know, how many clicks does it actually take? So we've, we've done a pilot study with 25 websites, um, and we plan to do this actually with hundreds of websites. My poor students have to actually read all of these. Um, and so they found there is some good things. Um, there are some websites that have nice, clear headings. How can I manage or delete information about me? And if you go there, it takes you directly to the page where you would opt out. But there are other privacy policies that have headings with words like how, not very clear. And then there's a link somewhere that's, you know, learn more here 
and that little here is hyperlinked, and you have to find that here and click on it, and that's how you get to the page that tells you about opting out. So this is not very clear at all. And there are some websites that have a multi-step process for opting out. Um, so here's one where first you have to navigate to the correct page. They have many, many choices. And uh, you have to figure out, well, what do you want to opt out of? And in this case, if I wanted to opt out of, say, email communication, wait, do I opt out of communication? Do I go to communication preferences or email? I mean, email seems like a type of communication. Um, and then if I go there, I find out that, oh, there's like 76 different categories of things that I can opt out of. And do I have to check all of those boxes? And then when I do get through checking or not checking, I scroll down to the bottom, and I have to actually tick the box that says, do not send, uh, send this email. And then I have to remember to click the update button, because if I don't click the update button, then all is for naught, and it, I will not opt out of anything. And then there are the websites that seem to have just multiple places to opt out of maybe the same thing, maybe different things. Uh, so this is Twitter, or this was Twitter, I guess, like until yesterday when I think they changed their privacy policy again, um, which a lot of websites are doing right now in preparation for GDPR. Um, so uh, on Twitter, if you want to uh, opt out, you can go to your account settings, um, and, uh, and there's, there's a button for opt out implemented by Twitter. Um, or you can go to Twitter's About Ads page, um, and there you have five links to five different opt-outs. Do they opt you out of the same thing or different things? I'm not entirely sure. And then I can go to the Privacy Policy, where I can find two different opt-out links. So it's not entirely clear which one of these I should actually follow, or whether I have to follow all five of them. So is this transparency? Is this actually helping people understand and control their data? I'm not so sure. So let's talk about a different issue here, the privacy features in web browsers. So most of the major web browsers have a number of privacy features, including uh, something which is often known as uh, private browsing or incognito. And there was a study that was presented here at this conference yesterday um, about whether people actually understand what these private browsing modes do. And what they found is that there's a lot of misconceptions. People assume that these private browsing modes are protecting them in ways that they don't actually protect them in. So these private browsing modes don't prevent geolocation, they don't protect you from malware, they don't eliminate advertisements, and they don't actually prevent tracking. Um, now, the good news was that they tested the information about these private browsing modes from a number of different web browsers, and they did find that actually the Chrome desktop uh, information was pretty good, that it definitely reduced the number of misconceptions that people had. But the information provided by the other web browsers was not so good. Now, my students have also been looking at this, and we've been using a tool that we have at Carnegie Mellon called the Security Behavior Observatory. So we have recruited participants from our, for, for our study who are home Windows computer users. And we pay them to allow us to install software on their computer that sends us information about their security and privacy behaviors. Um, at any given time, we usually have about 200 active participants who are sending us data. Now, in this study, this allows us to do a natural observation of what people are just doing on their computer, um, but we can also send them follow-up surveys or do interviews with them, and we pay them extra for that. So we've been looking at what these people do in private browsing mode. We collected all the URLs that people visit in private browsing mode, and we, we analyzed them to see what are they doing. Um, so the most common thing that we see people are doing is using private browsing mode to log into services. Uh, we expect this is services where people have multiple accounts, and so they use private browsing mode to try to separate what's going on in their different accounts. Um, there's lots of just general browsing, no apparent reason, uh, anything specific uh, to trigger private browsing mode. General searches. Um, a lot of people use private browsing mode for streaming audio or video. Um, some use it to access adult content, to visit social media sites, for shopping. Um, 
there's, there's a lot more adult content searches in private browsing mode than not in private browsing mode, as well as sensitive browsing and sensitive searches, which are mostly healthcare-related browsing and searches. Um, so what we see is that people are uh, actually using private browsing mode for a number of things which are sensitive, and their misconceptions about it could actually put them at risk. Okay, so let's talk about the security side of things. Passwords. People have lots and lots of passwords. How do they manage all of them? Well, we use data from the Security Behavior Observatory to try to get some insights into that. So another thing that we collect is hashes of the passwords that people enter into their web browser. And we also collect information about how long their passwords are, the strength, the number of character classes, and other things like that. So we analyzed data from 154 participants about their passwords. We found that on average, our participants had 26 different accounts that they accessed via their web browsers, but they had only 10 distinct passwords for those 26 accounts. And we looked carefully at, the, at their passwords, and we divided them into four groups. So we had the non-reused passwords, the password that a person used only once. That happened 21% of the time, not very much. Uh, then we had the people who exactly reused their password on multiple accounts. And that also didn't happen that much, only 16% of the time. And then there were the partially reused passwords. So first I create a password monkey1, then I create monkey2, monkey3, monkey4. Right, that's a partial reuse. But then we got to what we call exact and partial reuse. And these are people who create monkey1, monkey2, monkey3, and then they do it again. And they use monkey1 on five accounts and monkey2 on 10 accounts. That's actually half the passwords are being used in that particular way. So here it is graphically. Each of these bars represents one user in our study, and the colors represent the percentage of their passwords that are reused or not. Um, so we had a small group of users who didn't reuse very many passwords. But as you can see, they also don't have very many passwords. And then there was a small group of users who also don't have very many passwords, um, but they tend to partially reuse all the passwords they have. And then there was a bigger group that exactly reuses most of their passwords. And an even bigger group that's all over the place. Some passwords they reuse and some they don't. But there's one more group. These are the exact and partial reusers. And so you can see the green here are the passwords that they don't reuse. There's very few passwords that they're not reusing. Most of their passwords, they're both exactly and partially reusing. So reuse is completely rampant. And then we said, well, maybe they're just reusing passwords across certain categories. You know, surely they're financial passwords they're not reusing? Wrong. We found that almost every category of website, people are reusing their passwords a lot. Then we did a study in our lab where we invited people in and talked to them about passwords, and we found a lot of misconceptions. I'm just going to highlight a couple. A lot of people told us that a really good way to create a password is with a keyboard pattern, because it looks like really random-like, and yet you can remember it because you just go up and down your keyboard. But the thing is, a lot of people do this. Like Multiple people in, in our study did this. Um, and if you look at all of the lists of uh, of you know, hacker dictionaries, the, the, the list of passwords that, people are, that attackers are going to use, keyboard patterns are very high up there on the list, so don't do that. <laughs> Another misconception, so people told us that they knew that adding a symbol to the end of your password made it more secure. So they seemed to think you could take any old bad password and add an exclamation point on the end, which is the most common symbol in a password. And suddenly, magically, your password would be secure. This is, of course, also completely wrong. And it's not too surprising that people have misconceptions, because this is the kind of feedback they get. Your password is weak. Create a stronger password. Right? That teaches you nothing. So my students have developed a new uh, password meter. And this is on our website. We distribute this as an open source project. Um, and uh, we have both better um, 
uh, strength estimates for passwords than most of the password meters that, that are out there on the internet today. And we have actionable feedback that gives people specific suggestions, such as consider inserting digits into the middle, not just at the end. This is some actionable feedback about how to improve your password. And of course, you can also use a password manager. And this is really what I recommend that people do. Um, and uh, increasingly, we're, we're seeing this recommendation. But most people still don't use password managers. And we've also seen that even when people use them, they don't necessarily use them correctly. So here's a list of uh, passwords in somebody's password manager. And you can see here that, um, that this person has a super safe password, but they're using it in five different accounts. And then here, they have a whole bunch of not so safe passwords, and they're also reusing those too. And this is pretty typical. And the reason it's typical is because you can also see they have over 200 passwords. And it turns out that if you want to go and visit 200 websites and change all of those bad passwords into good ones when you use a password manager, it takes a really long time. I know I personally have been struggling to convert over with all of my bad passwords into good ones and having my password manager create good ones for me. Now, there are some promising new technologies and some hope that someday maybe we can get out of this whole password race. Um, so W3C is working on some things. And hopefully, something pans out well. But in the meantime, we really need to figure out how to use our passwords better and to use password managers to actually help us. OK, the last thing I want to talk about is security warnings. So you've seen these things. They pop up. And you all know what they say. They all say that, right? <laughs> um, and so people swat them away. This is actually one area, though, where I think we've had some, some improvement. So I started doing research on security warnings about 10 years ago. And they were all truly terrible. Um, and uh, we came up with some proposals for how to improve them. And we've actually seen the browser vendors have improved them. Um, and so uh, here's an example um, of a connection not private warning. And you can see it's like in plain English. And here's a, um, a, a phishing warning. And it's also pretty clear. Uh, and and uh, they do things like now actually the big button to press is the one for the safe thing. Um, so yes, there's still some room for improvement. But this is an area where, over the past 10 years, we've seen some real progress in improving the user experience for security. OK, so where do we stand? What do we still need to do to improve the privacy and security user experience? Well, first of all, I would like to see standardized privacy notices. Um, I think especially as we're, we're um, uh, pushing for more and more privacy notices, we are having regulations which are requiring more privacy notices. We still don't want people to have to read all of these long privacy notices and sort out all the differences between them. A standardized notice is going to be much, much easier for users. Even better. I still think we need machine-readable privacy notices and automated choice tools so that you don't actually have to read all of those notices, that you can have automated tools that can process these privacy policies for you, whether they're from websites or your smart light bulbs or whatever else in your environment. Um, and I think uh, you know, P3P is probably not the answer at the moment, but we need to find some way forward that will allow us to have computer-readable privacy notices. We also need to make sure that people understand how to use our privacy features. And that requires testing them with real people to find out what people actually understand and whether they know how to make the privacy feature do what they think it is supposed to actually do. And finally, we need convenient and secure ways to authenticate so that we don't all have over 200 different, oh wait, actually they're all the same passwords. So I will end with a photo of the students and staff in my lab at Carnegie Mellon. These are the people who make the magic happen. Thank you.